like to welcome you back to the final session of uh, this uh, event, the Multiplication Discipleship uh, event here held on the campus of Anderson University. And in this final session, we're going to talk about uh, what I'd like to call moving from the land of talk to the land of do. Um, my name is David Culp. I'm the lead pastor in St. Joe, Michigan, Church of God Congregation. Been there for about 17 years, grew up in the Church of God, multiple generations of the Church of God. And uh, we're a multi-site uh, congregation, uh, small town setting. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got four, four campuses uh, and just God's doing some amazing things. And some of what uh, has been helpful to us is a process that, again, helps you move from the land of talk to the land of do. We, over the last few sessions, and if you've missed any of the sessions, you can go back uh, on the YouTube channel and, and find some of those other sessions uh, where there's been some, just some great uh, content, just talking about multiplication, discipleship, and now we want to take some of those ideas and think about how can we move again from the land of talk to the land of do. Um, so I got my start in ministry as a senior pastor, a lead pastor in Ohio. I felt, followed uh, Pastor Vernon Maddox, Vernon Maddox, just a great pastor, allowed me to have a lot of opportunities for ministry, poured into me, encouraged me, led me as a young pastor. And then at 29, I don't know what the church was thinking, but they asked me after Pastor Maddox had gone on to be the state pastor in Ohio, they'd asked me to be uh, the, lead, the lead pastor. And really at 29, got uh, just thrown into the deep end of the pool. And there were two uh, gentlemen in the church. They had been corporate executives. Uh, one was uh, Charlie Burkholtz, David Alexander. They were uh, one, uh, David Alexander was a VP at uh, AK Steel, which was a steel mill in the community where we were at. And they took me under their wing and, and really helped me, uh, taught me about change management, leadership principles. And one of the things that David Alexander used to say all the time, we need to move from the land of talk to the land of do. So that's what I want to help us to do today, to take some of the ideas that we've talked about, some of the things that uh, maybe they got, were spurred in our, in our hearts as, we, as we've been in, this, in, this, uh, in this, uh, this last few sessions, and to think about how can we, how can we again, move the land of talk to land of do so we can, we can maximize the, the, the opportunity to, to really impact the kingdom, to take that content and not just randomly just take an idea, but, but what ideas fit into the context where we, we're at in our, in our ministry? Because it, what happens, it happens to all of us. We have these great ideas, and I've got, I've got notes that I've written uh, on my uh, piece of paper here. But you, you look at those, you look at those notes, and you get all, all of the stuff, but then you go back, and uh, you think, you know, uh, we've got all these things going on now. I've got the whirlwind of, of, the, of the task. I've got the, the emails I have to get, respond to. I've got phone calls that are, that are, that are coming in. I've got... the organization out of the land of talk into the land of do. I love what 1 Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32 says, and it comes, says this from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders uh, of the tribe with their relatives, and all these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course of action to take. So they understood the time and they understood the action to take. So in, us, in essence, they knew what it would look like to move from the land of talk. They were thinking about it. They had understood it. So that's the land of talk, trying to understand what's going on. But then they knew what to do. So it's, it's really getting to the, point, to the point of action. So I'm going to share some things over the next few minutes that for us in our context has, have, has been helpful, a process that's been help, helpful to move us from land of talk to land of do. And uh, you could you think of this, you know, this one of the ways you could, you could implement some of what we're going to talk about is you could do it in a small group. 
uh, of some leaders that you have, whether that's staff or lay leaders or whatever. But you can also take, and, and a lot of it will apply to that, but a lot of it too will apply if you're just you know, on your own, in your study, and if you work kind of through this process, you can do a lot of this just on your own if that's what you need to do in, in the moment. But just so just think about, chew the meat, spit out the bones, love to say that, uh, and what's gonna apply to, again, just give you some tools to help us move from land of talk to the land of do. Simon Sinek wrote a book, uh, Start With Why. And I think it's always important for us to start with why. Why do we need to move from the land of talk to the land of do? And I just want to remind us of the culture, the, the context of where we are in this, uh, in, in this moment as a, just in, in, in this world, in our, in our generation. Uh, you have just the, the context of the, the rise of the nuns. People are, are walking away from the church. People are, are going to especially young people are, are absolutely, you know, walking away. Uh, you, you, look at, you, you look at all the things that are, that, are, that are going on in this divisive political li- landscape that we, that we live in. I mean, how hard it is as for pastors and, and churches to try to navigate that. And we're coming into an election season, and don't even get me started with pastors who, who are making all of us look bad as they get more excited about the lo- latest social media-fueled issue of the day than really loving Jesus and, and shepherding what it looks like to represent him in our world. Uh, and then you've got all the mental health issues in pews and in congregations and in and pastors and cultural shifts that are impacting the church as the societal change changes are coming into conflict with the, the traditional orthodox teaching of the church and then we live in this age that is getting you know all these things together it's getting more and more complex and you think about COVID and all of us all the things that changed and the the reset in the church and you put all of that into this mix and it's this whirlwind and what should we do Gone are the days when it was just natural that the church or, or clergy would, would just get a pass and, and people would look to them as, and the church, look to the church as a, as a source of, uh, of uh, you know, some, the place you could trust. I mean, all, all that is gone. All that landscape is gone. So we cannot afford to take the tired forms of past generations and expect that those are going to work in the generation that we find ourselves in today. So what is the still small voice of the Spirit saying to us? Again, we've had had a lot of great sessions and we've we've talked and we've we've wrestled with some big concepts. But again, how can we move from the land of talk to the land of do? Because we cannot just go back and think that we can just use these tired forms and think that if we do the same things we've always done, that we're going to get different results than, we've, than we're currently getting as the church is just not moving in, in so many places in a good direction. So what do we do? What do we do when we understand that 1985 is not coming back, 1965 is not coming back? So what's going to happen? What's going to work in the context that we find ourselves in today in this wilderness of complexity? I love what Daniel Boone, frontiersman, said. When you're lost in the wilderness, bewildered, no fixed plan will do. You must think, act, and learn your way to safety. So as we think about that, and how does that relate to what we're talking about, we have to figure out with the help of the Holy Spirit and the still, the still small voice of the Spirit, the direction of Christ who is head of the church, God, where do, you, where do you want us to go? What, what's, the, what's in this season? What are you, what are you teaching us? What, are you, what do we need to learn to move us forward? To, again, think about what Daniel Boone said. Uh, because it's, it's a complex wilderness that we're in. And we have to, for the sake of the gospel, do the hard work of trying to discern that still small voice so that we can be like Paul who became all things to all men so that some people, different people, could be saved. When you think about the church, it's a living organism. It's a, it's a body. Warren Burke said this. He said, living systems that survive do so because they mutate. That is, they adapt to the changing forces in their respective environments. So again, in this final session, to think about all that's going on and what do we need to, how do we need to change? How do we need to mutate? How do we need to adapt into the current landscape that we are that we're in. So again, we to take what the men of Issachar said to understand our times so that they know what, so we would know what to do. And so I would propose that we 
that we that we use some tools. I mean, you use tools in all different areas of your life. Uh, they're helpful. They help us to do things just on our own. We might not able be able to do whether that's a screwdriver, or whether that's a, a hammer, or whether that's some 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 power tool that really helps us to do something. And what I would say is strategic thinking. This moving from the land of talk to land of do. Um, it's a tool to help us to just give God the space, the Holy Spirit, the space to discern the voice. And we just want to, to give God the opportunity to, to speak to us. Any pastor uh, can, can sit and do, again, what they've always done, hoping to get different results. Um, it really, it really as, as, we, as we think about that, uh, if we want to be faithful to, you know, to, our, to our God, to the one who's called us into this, into this work, then we need to do the, the, the difficult work. It's easy to stay in the land of talk. Just again, to do what we've always done. Uh, I remember when I was a young pastor, uh, my first assignment uh, out in Oklahoma and the, the senior pastor, he was getting close to retirement. Great guy, loved him. But I remember him saying to me, you know what? I don't want to do anything new because I'm getting too close to retirement, and so I don't want the new guy to have to, to, to clean up, you know, my messes that I'm, you know, uh, that I start, that I'm not going to finish. And I thought, you know what? And I, 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 I couldn't stay in that environment. I, I can't for one, for, for, for a single year or whatever my, it was, in, or two years till he was gone, I can't just sit around and just do, do what has always been done. The gospel is too important. The mission of the church is too important. The call is too vibrant from our master to sit on our hands and just hope that it gets better. And so I, I, I want to listen well. I want to use whatever tool at my disposal to, again, to give God, give the, 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 the spirit, give, give Jesus, the head of the church, an opportunity to speak to me, to do the work so that he can, so that he can speak. And so as we think about strategic thinking, this is what, um, this is what uh, Marlon Schweitzer said on the subject. And it's just, it's just a, a definition for us. He said, he wrote, strategic thinking involves looking at emerging trends, identifying whether or not they represent opportunities or threats to the organization, and developing an organizational response to take advantage of the potential opportunity to mitigate the threat. So all that said is strategic thinking is just looking at the landscape of what's going on and trying to discern what's the next step. What do, what do we need to do? What do we need to adapt? What, you know, as Daniel Boone said, how do, we, how, do we, how, do we, how do we move our way out of this wilderness that we find ourselves in? And so because I'm a preacher, I'm going to use some alliteration. And so I'm going to talk to you. And if you want to take some notes, I would encourage you to do that because we're going to give some tools and you can go back and hopefully this will be helpful to you. And, but the, I'm going to just want to just share the four R's of discovering the land of dew. And so we'll, let me just define them real quick and then we'll get in, we'll break them kind of open a little bit. But here are the four R's. The first would be, first step, again, trying to move from land of talk to land of dew. The first R I would just throw out as, as recognizing. And that's the step where you just kind of you do some scanning. You just kind of think about to, what's the current state that we find ourselves in? What's the, what's the world that we find ourselves in? What's the, where's the community? that? What's the context that, that I've been, that, that God has me in? Uh, you know, the church, what's going on? So again, like the men of Issachar, they understood the times that they lived in. And so how can we do the prayerful, difficult work uh, to go and just kind of look around? What's the, again, what's the, to recognize what's happening? The second R would be, again, moving, discovering the land of do. The second R would be resolving. So that's the step where, where you work to identify the elements of the vision that, that God, God has for the church that's going to move it forward. The gravitational pull of the church will always be to be inwardly focused. To just think about ourselves, to do what we've always done, to just to just make the people that are that are showing up every week happy. Lost people don't typically call and complain. It's the people, the people that are far from God. They're not calling you up, wondering why you're not doing stuff for them. It's the people in the pews you have to deal. We have to deal with. But again, what what is we think about moving to the land of the land of do? We've been called to go into the world and to make disciples. And so, what what do we need to resolve? To, again, to to resist that gravitational pull to just be inwardly focused. What's the, the vision of the church that will help the church in this next ministry season? What's the compelling kingdom expression? 
where we can really become and to live out God's ideal for us in this season. So that's the resolving stage. And then the next stage would be uh, reacting. So, and that's the, that's the stage, again, move from land of talk to land of do, where we, we get together an executable plan. How can we actually do it? Um, not just copy what someone else is doing. There's nothing wrong with looking around and getting ideas. As I said in the earlier panel, I've never had an original idea myself. And so, so uh, you love to look around, love to see what other people are doing because that inspires you to think about what could be in your own, in your own context. But, but what we really have to discern, what's the unique thing, God, that you want us to do in, in our ministry context? And so you resolve to figure that out and then react. You begin to to put some action items into, uh, in, 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 into, the, into the mix so you can actually execute on that plan. And then the, the last step would be where you go to refocus. And that, a lot of times we stop, if, if we get through the process this far, we stop right here and we don't do that refocus. And refocus is where you, you do some evaluation, you, you, you're holding people accountable. Again, you, you, you get tired after <laughs> these first three steps sometimes. And you don't do that final piece of the work of, of going back and refocusing and, and calling people out and, and how are we doing on that and where are we at and holding people accountable. And even going back and thinking about, okay, that was, we really felt like that was where the, God wanted us in that moment. Are we, is that still God where you want us to be? And so that's an ongoing conversation. And so this last step is that ongoing conversation with God to say, Hey, is this still where you're at? So let's let's jump in then to this to step one and just think about recognizing uh, as we end moving from the land of talk to the land of uh, the land of do. So what's this what's this process? What's it look like for us to discover? And as I said, you can either do this with a team of people, maybe that's some staff, maybe that's some some lay people, depending on the context of your church. Um, you know, I would suggest no more than, you know, six to 12 people. But if, but if it's, you know, you just need to do this, some, some work, you and the Lord, just one-on-one, you know, just think about how you can apply this, chew the meat, spit out the bones, how you can apply it again in your, in your context. Maybe it's just, just you and the Lord together, but so whatever, just, just think about how this applies. So let's think about this first step of, of, of recognizing again, to clearly understand uh, where you are and to understand where you are and where you need to go, sometimes the best place to start is to go back and think about the history. So what is the history of the church? What's the, what, what would the community say about your congregation? What, what, does, what, are, what are people, uh, in, as they think about your, your church, what's the, what are the former pastors? As you, if maybe you uh, talk to them, what are they, what, what do they say about the congregation as they've as they serve the congregation. What, and here's one of the ways that we have, have done this practically in our context was just to ask the question, you know, if we look, and our church is 110, 115 years old now, if we were to look over that, that, that all of those years of ministry, what would be the front page newspaper articles if they were ever written about our church? What would be those newspaper articles? One of those would be in around 1919 or so, our church is in uh, southwest Michigan, right on Lake Michigan. And if you've never been to Michigan, it gets very cold in Michigan. And sometimes, now not the whole lake, but a lot of the lake will freeze over depending on how cold it is. And there were some people that had come to Christ in January in our church. The year was 1919. And so the church decided to have a baptismal service. These people were so excited about getting baptized that in January in Michigan with ice on the lake, they go out onto the ice, they chip holes in the ice, and they're baptizing people in Lake Michigan. Now that's some, that's some, some committed folk <laughs> to, uh, uh, to uh, you're really wanting to, to, be, to be baptized, have a high value of baptism. And we have, we, you know, Church of God, we love baptism. So, uh, the, so the newspaper, and we literally have this newspaper article. The article that appeared in the newspaper is what happened as people were out on the ice. The ice broke. And the newspaper article is about how they had to rescue people out of Lake Michigan at the Church of God's baptismal service. So, so that literally is one of the newspaper stories from our history. But that, that says some things. That reminds us that, that this church from its inception had this high value of reaching people for Christ, of calling them 
uh, to, to take that next step in their walk with Christ. Our, our church started the first 40 years or so. It was, it was made up of German immigrants, Eastern European in, immigrants that had come and settled in, in this area. And so f until the 40s, all the services were in German. That's a part of our history. Uh, as the church grew, the, 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 the ones that started the church, they built with their own hands the first, the, the, literally the brick that became the first building, uh, that three-story building. That was, uh, they built it themselves, the third story. And you can go back into the archives of the Church of God. And there's, this, there's stories where it talks about the first church in St. Joe. And the third story was dedicated to missions, missionaries coming off the field. It was called uh, Missions Home, Faith Missions Home. That was the, they could come and they could convalesce on the shores of Lake Michigan. Missionaries. So baked into the DNA of our congregation is this heartbeat for world mission. That's who we've been. And as we had our first pastor that was a non-German speaking pastor, it, that decision was made. The people in the, they all spoke German. So to, to even to make the decision to not continue having services in German was a conscious decision. These people made our, and we stand on their shoulders, they were making the decision that if we're going to continue to reach people for Christ in this community and beyond just the people that are like us, then we've got to have services in English. And so they made that decision. They, they were in, in an era where churches weren't having multiple services. Everybody thought, you know, the way that Jesus did church is everybody was in the same room at the same hour, singing the same songs, listening to the same message from the same preacher. Uh, because that's the way Jesus did it. Uh, but they had, you know, the, 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 king, the head of the church, Christ, imparted something different to them. And they started having multiple services way back before other people were having multiple services. So those things are in the, in the DNA. The pivot that we made several years ago to become a church not just focused inwardly, but to focus outwardly into our community, all those things play. And so, so to think about your history, to go back and, and as you're recognizing, to think about history. And then the second thing, a, a word that preachers use is exegesis. And so to do some community exegesis, that word to exegete, when you exegete a text as a pastor, you, you, you seek to understand, to understand it. You, you seek to remove the mystery of the text. So, so do you understand, do we understand the context, the community that we live in and to, to exegete the community, to understand the demographics, to, uh, to do a demographic study of the, of, of the people. The census is, is a great resource. And you can look at the census tracts. What are the census tracts? I it, this book I carry carry around uh, with me everywhere. And in here, this uh, I've got the I've got these are all the census tracts, and it has the demographic uh, data broken down by 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 the, the different census tracts of my of, of the county that I live in. I want to know the people that I'm trying to serve. We need to not just you know be in our churches and 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 think that we know the people. But we need to get out and understand the people. So to read the local newspaper, to to talk to people that that uh, that are around that are around us uh, in the community, both inside and outside uh, the church is one of the the church. One of the things that we do in our in our context is we have our under, we have four campuses, and so one of the campuses is in a really under resourced area, and so we do community dinners. And we just ask people, you know, how, what would be, a, what would make your, this community a better place? How can we come alongside you? How can we bless you? We've knocked on every door of, of the community asking those kind of questions. So again, how can we seek to know the history and then to exegete the community so we understand who it is, the demographics of the people that God has called us to, to reach? And one of the one of the things that we found out as we knocked on those doors in that under-resourced community was people started just talking about, well, you know, access to laundry was something that uh, there's no there's no there's no laundry laundry mat in that community. Uh, there's a, in that under-resourced area, one of the uh, that has the highest mortality rate, uh, one of the highest mortality rates in in census tract 22 and 23 in Michigan, highest mortality rates in Michigan, uh, a lot of poverty, a lot of people living under the, the poverty threshold, all those things. And there's a lot of slumlords in that area, a lot of, a lot of you know, homes that they don't have washers and dryers that, that are up to, you know, 
up to speed, whatever. There's well water, a lot of those homes. Uh, we just, as we talk to people and listen to people, actually listen to people's stories, people telling stories about how they were um, doing the laundry for their children and put it in and hanging them or uh, 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 drying them in the, in the ovens. And, and, and to think about what, how can we come alongside people? How can we help people? That's a, that's a need. Um, and so it just you, know, you get that when you when you listen and you understand maybe what God, what are you doing as we listen to people and we understand and exegete the community that God has us in. A- another thing that I think that we need to do as we think about uh, think about this this process of of just kind of looking around at, at what's happening is to what I would call to identify the irreducible complexity of the gospel. Uh, Michael Behe, he's a biochemist and, uh, and won't get into why he it, it, it kind of coined the term uh, irreducible complexity, but I just love the idea that there are some things in life that are irreducibly complex. A uh, simple example is a mousetrap. If you think about a mousetrap, a mousetrap, and if, if you imagine if I'm holding a mousetrap, and you think about the different pieces of a mousetrap, you've got the base, you've got the spring, you've got the, you've got the place to put the cheese, you've got you know, all these different pieces. And think about if you took any of those pieces away, how effective the mousetrap would be. It, it ceases to be a mousetrap the moment that you take the, the thing that, that, that is the bait that attracts the mouse, or you take the arm, or you take the spring, or you take the base that it's all attached to. At, at any of those things are taken away, it is, it's a, as a system, it's irreducibly complex. And it, what I would throw out to us is, as we think about, God, what are you doing? Is it to think about how is, in our context, the gospel irreducibly complex? What are the basic things in the gospel that we're doing, that we've been called to, that, that if we're going to be the church that, that honors Jesus and does it Jesus' way, that we, we have to do that thing, whatever that thing is. And so there's some texts. I would encourage you to study these texts. So what's, what's in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? What's that say? What's the Great Commission say? What's the Great Commandment say? What does, what does uh, Acts 2, the end of Acts 2, where it talks about what's going on, 42 through 46, talks about what's going on in the early church. What are the things that they were doing that we need to do in our context? What does, what does Luke 15, the story, three stories of the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost, the lost son, what do those stories, what do they say about what Jesus wants us to do? Again, as he is head of the church, what, does, what is the irreducible complexity of the church? And for us, as we thought about that, uh, uh, is, is we, there's three buckets that we've reduced it down to for us in our context. Is you got to be worshiping, you got to be serving, and you got to be discipling or growing people in their faith. And, and you can't take any of those three things away and still, I don't think, in, my, in the context I'm in, to be doing the things that Jesus called us to do. Now, you can add things to that, but that, that, that's irreducibly complex. And so, and there's a lot of different ways to, to, to think about that, and there's different ways to say it. But, but what, because later, you, I, I would want us to use this and to think about, uh, as we think about do some strategic planning to use that then in the next step. So you need to think about it. You need to think as you think about this, this first step to think about what is the irreducible complexity. Another thing that I would suggest that you do would be just an analysis. And uh, if you've come maybe from the business world or you've been around uh, strategic planning or whatever, a SWOT analysis is something pretty common. Uh, if you've, uh, again, hung out in the business world at all. And the SWOT analysis, very simply, is just uh, to think about the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the potential threats. And so just to do that for the church, to just, again, as another, another thing to do is you're kind of just looking around at, you know, just, just recognizing what's, what's happening, happening in your context. So what are the, and so just kind of go that, through that really super quick. So what are the, what are the strengths to consider? What's going well in your, in your context as you, and you can just write these up, or if you're doing it by yourself, just kind of write them in a, you know, write them in a thing about what's going currently well, what's adding value, what's adding kingdom value for you, what are the things that you're known for in the community. You can go back to the history thing you did earlier, maybe, you know, pull some of that things in, just, just kind of thinking about it. And again, gave, giving the spirit space to speak to you about what's happening in your context. So the next thing would be weaknesses, what's not going so well, what needs to be improved, what's taking energy and resources, but there's very little, very little that you're getting a value in return for that. Uh, and in the church, we love to start new things 
we are always afraid to kill things that aren't working so well. And so what's the thing that you might need to have a nice funeral, celebrate that it was a great thing back in 1950, but maybe we don't still need to be doing it. So what's the, what are the things that are weaknesses? They're sucking the life and energy out of you. I'm sorry, this wasn't a therapy session. Uh, let's, let's go on. Uh, opportunities. What are the opportunities that are out there that uh, if you were to do them, maybe they're not part of the church now, but they're potential kingdom kind of opportunities. Yeah, so I'll give you an example of this for us. So we, where our original campus is, it's an upper, upper middle class community on the banks of, of uh, uh, Lake Michigan. We have Whirlpool's World Headquarters is located there. So there's a lot of uh, the, the, the CEO, the VPs, all the people, a lot of engineering, about 3,000 corporate jobs, but high-level corporate jobs. We've got two nuclear plants on either side of our, of our community. We've got a really awesome hospital system. So when you think about all of that together, we've got a lot, we've got a leadership culture in our community. And just like the person that maybe has some addiction issue or their life's spinning out of control and they don't know where their next meal is going to come to and they've lost their job and they're struggling and, and they don't know if they're going to be able to pay the, the light bill or the mortgage or whatever. There are people that have everything that this world has to offer and they are lost, 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 and they need Jesus. So think about in our context, there's an opportunity there for us to be Jesus in that context. So so we started what was called the Lead Table Series, where we brought in a, a speaker over a lunch hour, invite people. It was a, an event where you could invite your uh, unchurched, dechurched pe- person far from God that was your work partner or your boss or whatever. You could invite them into this, this lunch kind of setting. We'd have a, a short talk that was some leadership principle that they could readily apply. Anybody in the room, whether you knew Jesus or not, you could apply this principle to your to your life as a leader, and then to do some networking, because everybody loves networking, uh, do some networking around those tables, and as a side door, as side door evangelism. That was an opportunity that we saw in our context. What are the opportunities that you see in your context? You and the Lord talk about that. And then the, the last thing, what's the potential threats? What are the factors outside the church? What's going on locally, nationally, even internationally? What's the, the, the things that potentially the trends that could derail you? Uh, so for us, uh, just got word recently that Whirlpool is thinking about lay, where they they are. They're laying off some some folks. So so that has the potential. So as I'm as we're doing uh, our own strategic plan, we're working on our budget. That's an input to think about what happens if a few hundred people get laid off. What you know that's a that's a potential threat for us. What about the 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 election that's coming up and all the turmoil that that's gonna that's gonna happen in our churches again. Answering the question, what are the potential threats as you do that analysis? Another thing that I think would be really helpful for us as leaders that, again, you can do in the context of, of you with a, with a small group of leaders, you can do on your own. Again, because we're, what we're talking about, moving from land of talk to the land of do, uh, is, again, something that's been really helpful to us. I don't know if you know what a Venn diagram is. A Venn diagram is just a series of... Uh, it's just a way for you to look at how things are related, how they c- to compare and contrast things, how they uh, how things are interrelated. So imagine three concentric circles, and so let's let's imagine uh, thinking about you know a circle that is all the things that you're good at. Another circle might be uh, all the things, and talking about jobs. And then so what are the things that that you're good at? What are the things that the potential jobs that, that are out there that pay really well? And then the third circle would be things that you love to do. So what you're good at is one circle. What pays really well is another circle. And what you love and you're passionate about is another circle. And where those circles intersect, uh, that's that sweet spot. And that's where you want to find a job. <laughs> it's not something that pays well that you're not good at. You're probably not going to be last very long in that one. Or something that pay doesn't pay well but it's it's something you love and you're good at and that's you know that's a recipe for um, really struggling to pay the pay the mortgage so but where is that that sweet spot so a Venn diagram just as a way to think about how things interrelate and so I want you to think about a Venn diagram for the kingdom and there's three concentric circles and the first circle would be uh, what I would just throw out as as king as as community needs to think about 
what are the needs of the community? And that's, again, we've done some of this work before because you've done, you've exegeted the, the community so you know what those needs are. And so just think about that. You could, you could list those things. Talk about those. If you're with a group, talk about all of those things. What are the needs of the community? And then to think about, okay, in our context, in our, in our church, what are the, what are the resources that, that we have available. And resources are things like, uh, like your buildings, your, uh, one of the panelists earlier talked about her 10 acres she had. Oh, wow, I'd love to have 10 acres. Uh, so land, vehicles, uh, your loca- the location that, where you're at, uh, all those things, all those things are, are your, are your, uh, are the, are the, uh, are the resources at your, that, that are available, or that are available to you. Um, and then the, the other thing are the gospel opportunities. What are those things that if you did them, they would help you to be able, they just have an opportunity to, to, to have some, you know, gospel ex- expression. Um, and where, again, you have the opportunity to, to share Christ with somebody, maybe if uh, all those opportunities. So, and where those three circles in this diagram come together is right here in the middle. And that's what you could call kingdom, kingdom impact. And to be able to try to do the work of identifying that. Let me give you an example. So we had, as I said, we had gone to the community. We'd ask everybody in the community. We'd knocked on doors and we'd made lists and we had these community dinners. You know, what, are the, what, what's gonna, what would be a blessing to your community? What would be helpful? What, uh, how can you know, we, we serve you? And in this little under-resourced community, one of the things that kept coming up to the top of the list was um, speed bumps. Speed bumps. We need speed bumps. People drive through our community super fast, and we got children, and, and they're outside because just the community, the kids are outside a lot, and they go to you know homes. They're just and you know parents, you know, are, they're working, and so their kids sometimes they're home alone, and so it was just a, a dangerous situation that you know they were afraid that you know kids gonna get hit or whatever, and so just just thinking about that, so that is a community need. And do we have as a church the resources to maybe help with some speed bumps? Well. Sure, I, you would probably do. We could probably figure out how to. But you know what? There's not a whole lot of gospel opportunities when uh, you're uh, helping put some speed bumps in. So uh, as of yet, we've not, not that there's anything wrong with helping a community put some speed bumps in their community, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't, because you only have so many, so many resources. It's not the sweet spot. So the sweet, sweet, spot, sweet spot for us was this idea of a laundromat. Because that, that's, they kept saying that as well. So it was a need. Um, again, they don't have access to a facility that was miles away. Don't have the, the, the it's well water, it messes their clothes up. There are a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the, the homes are rentals and so they don't have the washers and dryers. And so it's a community need. Resources, if you were paying attention, where, who, who did I say? What's the community that we're in? Whirlpool has its world headquarters. I have people in my church that wake up and every day they talk about washers and dryers. Their whole work world is all about washers and dryers. I've got the VP of this and the director of that in my congregation. So I've got people that I can lean on, that I can talk to. I know the people that are on the Whirlpool Foundation where they've got a gajillion dollars that they just kind of dole out to, to, to people. And so we've got the, the resources. And then the, the really cool thing is, what do you do when you come to a laundromat? You sit there for hours as your clothes are washing. Is there any opportunity maybe to do some Jesus work while people are, are doing their laundry. We can do Bible studies and we can do after school programs and I can teach langu- English as a second language and I can, do, I can do blood pressure screenings. I can have the hospital come in and, and they can do some things with people. I can, I can, I can help people prepare their resumes. And, and so there are any number, there's scores of gospel opportunities. And so you don't need to create a laundromat. You just need to exegete your community you need to, again, move from the land of talk to the land of do and to think about uh, in this Venn diagram just one way to help you. It's just a tool to help you to think about um, what could be as you listen to that still small voice 
of the Spirit. So let's talk uh, quickly. And the other ones aren't as long as we took with that first one. But the, the second step would be just to resolve. To As we think about these four steps. Again, we're trying to get out of the land of talk into the land of do. So we've recognized. So taking all that we've just talked about. Thinking about the community. Thinking about the history. Thinking about the exegeting the, you know, that community. Um, doing all those, other, all those other things. So with that in mind, now we resolve what we, are we going to actually do. So identifying the vision of the land of do. And, you know, it's really important that we don't get, I mean, some of us just love to just stay up in the clouds and just talk and, and vision and dream and, and all that. But this is, the, this is where we start to land the plane. We get out of the clouds and begin to think about, okay, what do we actually need uh, now to do? Because we can't do everything, and this is where we resolve, uh, what are we actually going to do? What are the key initiatives? Here's a question to ask yourself. And this is, a, and I, I'm going to give you one way to think about it and the way not to think about it. Here's the question. What are the key kingdom initiatives that will do the most to advance the kingdom in this next ministry season? Now, that's different than ask, and it's subtle, but it's different. It's different than asking yourself, what's the most important thing to do? Those two things might be different. What, and, and so I, I would just encourage you to think about, as you, on, in this resolving phase of identifying the vision of what, of what you're going to do as you move from land of talk to land of do, what's the key question, what's the key kingdom initiative that's going to do the most to advance the kingdom, to, 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 uh, to just please the Father. You know, what's, what, what's going what's gonna to do that? And so we have to, you remember before we talked about that we're going to, the irreducible complexity uh, of the gospel, that we're going to narrow that down. And so if you take those things, so it's three, four things, four things, whatever, whatever it is, however you, you know, kind of define that for us, again, it's worship, grow, serve. Some of you are familiar with the intentional church's model. And if you're familiar with what they call the Great Commission Engine, good book, good, 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 good stuff. You can look at that and go online, check that out. But in that Great Commission Engine, the way they identify those kind of those what they call the pistons of the church that drive the church, that drive the engine of the church. They call, talk about the catalytic weekend experience, life changing relationships. And then surrendered living. That's the three things. So whether you use worship, grow, serve, we use some other variation on that theme, catalytic week experiences, life change relationships, surrendered living, whatever it is, just don't. It's just hard when you just randomly think, okay, God, what randomly do we want to do? It just helps you to just break it down a little more narrowly to think more specifically and make sure because all of us have areas that I, I'm an outreach guy. I don't know if you got that vibe, <laughs> but I, I love thinking about how to reach that next person for Christ. But, but, uh, but there's other areas, so I can't just be, you know, myopic in my focus. I got to think about other, other, other things. And so, so as, you, as you think about that, so here, so take those areas, worship, grow, serve, or whatever it is, and then uh, begin to brainstorm what would it look like for us to then to, 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 to resolve, again, taking all that information where you are recognizing some things. And so uh, what would it look, what, what would you to potentially do? So here's, here's what I would suggest. And again, you can do this as an individual, but I think it's, 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 it's more effective if you do it as a, with, a, with a small group. And with that small group, you could, here's, here's the way we do it. You can do it however way, but here's what we do. We put up on a wall, worship, grow, serve, big, you know, post-it notes or whatever, maybe a dry erase board, whatever. And then you give whoever's there, the group, again, 6 to 12, whoever it is, index cards or big post-it notes, Sharpie, and just to give the Spirit some time to talk, talk to us, and just ask them one area at a time, start with worship or grow or whatever, and just, for instance, start with worship, and what are, after taking all the inputs that you've done, what are the things that the Spirit is just laying in your heart that could be things that you could do in this next ministry season? Because what's the question? Kingdom initiatives that will advance the mission of the church. And just write down those ideas. And then you collect those ideas, put them up on the wall. And as you put them up on the wall, there's going to be some things, you know, people are going to say some similar things. So you, you kind of group them together. Some people don't understand strategic thinking and they put weird stuff that you could never do and so you just like pile lightly oh that's a 
Great idea. Would have never thought of that. And you move on. Uh, so you, because you, you got, might have to clarify a few things that are confusing. So those those areas, and you do that for every area. So you've got now, and then I always add a miscellaneous category because there's always some things that don't really fall in those categories so easily. And so uh, to just to have that miscellaneous category. So you've done that work. You've kind of thought, what are the potential things? And then what I like to do is to give then, everybody loves stickers. You go with a doctor. Wasn't it fun when you were a kid and you got a sticker? So to give people stickers, little stickers, and we use little star stickers, and then we let them get up and say, we want you, we're going to give you three or four votes in each category. And I want you to put what just you can, I want, this is the way you get to vote. Just put a sticker on the thing that you think is going to move the church forward. What's, what's the Lord saying to you? And so everybody votes and they can put their stickers on where they vote. And so by the end of that, then you get a, a list of things that are the big master list of things potentially that you could do. And you've got three or four that you could group the top three or four in each area in the miscellaneous category. So for us, again, I've got my little book with me because I had written them all down. And so this, then we had a master list of the, of the things that, that we potentially uh, could do. I just want, let me just share a, a few of the, that came literally off of our list. Uh, celebrate, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, leader training for lay people. Start Celebrate Recovery at our St. Joe campus because we already have it at a different campus. Uh, regularly offer service projects in the community. Develop a culture of invitation. Start a new believers group. Intentional, intentionally leverage our preschool, we have a preschool, to reach unchurched, de church families. Start a service for individuals with disabilities and families. And so we had this master list, and then uh, I let everybody again have three or four votes, or yeah, three or four votes, and asked them to vote for their top three or four. And then, then that then allowed us to rank them from the one, there's 15 on this list, one to 15, then we ranked them. Uh, and then from there, we just, you know, here's the, we took that. And as a, as a senior leader, if you're the senior leader, you know, I'd always say that you do, I feel like because God's put you in, in a place of authority there, you do have the right to play your, I'm in charge and we're not doing that dumb thing that was actually at the top of the list. <laughs> I've never had to do that in all the years that I've done a process, a similar iteration of a process like this. Always it's really cool the way the Spirit just seems to lead in that group um, and how things that, that uh, and I, I typically don't even vote, uh, and to see things that, wow, I was thinking about that, and, and now it's the top thing that we've all agreed to. But then everybody's got that, that buy-in. And so... On that list, you've got that, then you'll come away with one to, you know, one to two or three things. You can't do 15 things. And even though there's probably 15 good ideas that come out of a process like that, what in the next ministry season over the year, to move from land of talk to land of do, what's the thing that God is saying? And you could take maybe one to three, and then you can kind of move to that, that next step. And as you create that master step. The other thing I would say is sometimes when you have that group of 15 things, there are, uh, there are some, some of those that uh, might be so simple that you can just say to one person. Like our preschool director was in that group, and uh, we said to her, you know what, we don't need a whole team <laughs> around the helping to reach unchurched families through a preschool. She was already on that, so we just said, hey, knock yourself out. Just make that happen, and she did that. But the other ones, we then put a team around with a point person leader, uh, and then let's talk about... Uh, and the third, kind of the third piece, then what we, what I, what I would call in the, the, the four, these four R's of moving the land of talk, from land of talk to land of two, what we call reacting. And that's where we take, uh, and you could, those three things, we, we always give them a name. Whether it's this, in this next ministry season, this is an area of concentration for us. We've got these one or two or three areas of concentration. You might call them. Uh, intentional churches calls them VIPs, Vision Initiative Projects. You can call them BHAGs, Big Hairy Algacious Goals. You can call them WIGs, Wildly Important Goals. Whatever in the world you want to call them. Call them something. Put a team around it. And then this next step is where you write some smart goals um, to, to move from the land of talk to the land of do. A smart goal. 
Very simply, if you don't know what a SMART goal is, it's just a way to, to write a goal so you can accomplish something so it's not just nebulous. You, so you're not just saying, yeah, I want to lose weight or I want to be healthier, and, but, you don't, <laughs> there's, but you, you don't have any goals around how you actually are going to get healthier. And so if you want to do these things, you need some SMART goals. So what's a SMART goal? Let's just talk about it. Uh, SMART goals are specific. Measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound. Many of you are familiar with, with how to write a SMART goal. Uh, specific is just, it needs to be well-defined, the goal. So if you're, you know, what are those things you're going to do is, what's the goal that you write around it? It's got to be detailed. It's got to be meaningful. Uh, so it's got to be a specific goal. It's got to be a measurable goal. So how are you going to actually know when you've accomplished it? Uh, what's the uh, measures help you to stay on track? Uh, How is it achievable, you know, as you think about it? Is it, you need some things that are going to stretch you, but it's got to be realistic. There's nothing worse than having a goal that you write that there's just, everybody knows there's no way in the world we're going to reach a million people for Jesus. Well, there's no way that's going to happen. So what's the, what's the, what's the actual realistic goal uh, uh, for you? Uh, what's achievable? And then what's relevant? It should push the mission of the church. It should relate to what Again, Jesus has told us to do. We're not looking. You don't need more busy work. The ministry, the church world, you've got enough busy work. What's going to move the kingdom, advance the kingdom? And so it needs to be relevant. And then finally, it needs to be time-bound, uh, a timeline. And, and time-bound even, what's the start date? And then what's the end date? So we do things typically over a year. So the next year, uh, here's the things we're going to do. And so for us, there was that creating that, that culture of invitation, and it really became a, the goal, the, the VIP Vision Initiative uh, project was around evangelism. And so evangelism, prayer, uh, we've, done, uh, we've done before. So just, just different things. So I encourage you to think about what, do, what does that, to write some goals around it. And then as you write the goal, then the next step would be, to, what, are the, what are the specific things that you want to do? What are the action steps that are going to get you toward that goal? And as you write action steps with those as well, you need to have action steps that where you can uh, have a, some accountability around that. You know, who's, who's accountable to that? How much is that going to cost? You know, when's that, when's that action step that goes back to the, to the SMART goal to help you accomplish a SMART goal? And so that's just all a part of the process. So let's conclude with that final step of refocusing. Again, as I said at the beginning, refocusing is something that often we forget to do. So there needs to be a regular cadence of evaluation and accountability. Whatever you expect, as they say, you need to inspect. So if you're going to move into the land of do, then you need to have this regular cadence of thinking and uh, uh, you know, following back up. And how do, you, how do you do that? Is that you have a regular, in your regular meeting time, you, you set aside some time where the people that are the, in charge of those, uh, those vision initiative projects or whatever you're calling them, that they report out? Is it them giving a report to your council or your board of elders or whatever? But what, just what is the regular cadence of evaluating how you're doing, accountability? We have to hold people accountable. We can't, make, we have to make sure that we don't skip that that step. And then to celebrate as, you know, that's part of it too, to celebrate when, when things are going well, uh, to go back and again, to continually ask yourself a question, God, is this still what we need to be doing? Is there any tweaking to this? And so that's a part of this refocusing as well. So as I conclude, uh, we're, I want you to just encourage you again, chew the meat, spit out the bones. What is God doing for you? What, uh, you know, God deserves our best. I just want to encourage you uh, God deserves leaders that are serious about moving the church, his church, from the land of talk to the land of do. And I just would remind us, we've got a lot of churches of God, folks. I know there's others that will probably listen to this as well. But I just would remind us of who we are. We are the church of God. Reformation movement. Let's not forget we're the movement. It's not enough to just do what we always did hoping for the best into the future. What in our generation, in the spirit of D.S. Warner and others, the spirit of innovation, what is it in our generation? This is our time. We are in charge. And in our time, what are we going to do? What are you going to do to advance the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can hear those wonderful, beautiful words from our Savior, well done, my good and faithful service servant. 
couple of resources as we conclude. Um, and I mentioned intentional churches. They have a website. They talk about, and a lot of church guy congregations now are using some of their process. We, we do it as a church. That's a resource. Will Mancini wrote Church Unique. That's a good, that's a great book that talks about strategic planning and things. Disciplines of, the Four Disciplines of Execution uh, by Covey. That's another great resource. And, and let me just go back to what we said at the very beginning to quote Daniel Boone, to go back to what he had to say. When you're lost in the wilderness, bewildered, no fixed plan will do. You must think, act, and learn your way to safety. Thank you for a chance uh, you've given me to, to share with you. I hope if there's any way I can serve you, help you out in any way. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Let me just pray for us as we conclude. Father, thank you for the opportunity as we and turn it over to Dr. Willoughby here in a second. God, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Pray, God, that you would help the church to listen and to hear your voice so that we can be just obedient to what you're calling us to do in our generation. We love you, Father. Thank you for the privilege of serving and leading. Pray your rich blessing on everybody that listens to this. May your will be done through us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, I'm Dr. Nathan Willoughby. I'm so glad that you've joined us uh, for this event. Uh, the, the health of the church is so important. The life of the church in the future is so important. And, and we believe here at Anderson University that the future is in God's hands, but we have a part to play in it. And we know that you're watching because of that. I just want to share a few things of the ways that we are trying to provide resources. If you know a person who is responding to a call of ministry, we and the other Church of God colleges are here to serve those folks. We are here to equip. We have undergraduate through seminary training. We have a certificate in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking pastors. We, we, are offering, we are offering things that we think meet a specific need in the church too. You already have a degree. We, we shared yesterday um, at a dinner here on site that in the fall, we're going to be having an online course. Maybe you're thinking about some ways you're going to spin off some um, some kind of side corporation, or you're going to get involved in something new. You're going to start a nonprofit in connection with your church. We're going to be offering a course at the seminary in the fall. You can audit, you can take for credit, but it's going to be with Steve Justice, General Counsel for Church of God Ministries, and it's a course on church and state relations. It's basically, the way he describes it is basic law knowledge for pastors. As our, our churches intersect other things um, in the world, businesses, or business law, tax law, uh, First Amendment law, we have a national preaching clinic coming up this summer in June. Um, our director for the Massey Center for Compelling Preaching is on his way to Missouri to present. We're here to serve in those capacities. We're so excited to host the Concilio Convention on Anderson University's campus in July, the 24th through the 27th. If you're able to come join that gathering, we'd love to see it. In October, they'll be on this stream or our Facebook Live. Our Newell Biblical Lectures will be out. And we have a Pauline scholar, Dr. Lisa Bowens, on campus, um, and she's going to be presenting another free event for you to just be enriched, be revived. Um, additionally, uh, if you're at a Church of God event this year, chances are a SOTCM representative is going to be there. The regionals, um, the Pastors Fellowship, the Concilio Convention, IYC, uh, Zion's Hill, uh, we're going to be there. And if you're around, we'd love to see you. At this time, I do want to take some time to recognize and thank some folks that have made this possible. I want to start with the, the students of the Anderson University Cinema and Media Arts program. They have come outside of their class hours, inside of their class hours, to run cameras, to work in the tech room. Um, they are getting this hands-on experience and producing this for you, and you can see the quality of their work. I want to thank Ramon Rivera for hosting the Spanish Zoom call and for Abby Torgensen for serving as our translator. I want to thank um, Jamie Dieterle for all the logistics and for Chris Renas for guiding us through this streaming event. This event grew from the steering committee about multiplication and discipleship, meeting time and again on Zoom calls, talking about a vision, thinking about who some voices were who could speak into this. And I want to recognize and thank those folks, Reverend Dr. Ron Duncan, Reverend Vernon Maddox, Reverend Dr. Ed Love, Reverend Mike Claypool, Reverend David Culp, 
and Reverend Steve Terry, both of whom served as panelists. I also want to thank our panelists, Leo Robinson II, uh, Katie Lance, Beth Wolf, Ephraim Cirillo, and Jake Saskey. It has been such a joy to be part of this work. You know, I believe in the Church of God. I believe that God has work to do through the Church of God. I believe that as an institution serving the Church of God, we have a mission, but we also have a vibrant lifeline of God's activity in our work. God is living and pouring out the Spirit on people to do kingdom work. I know that in this coming year, some of you who have been watching are going to have new stories to tell about ways that God has been multiplying and deepening disciples in your space. We know that new churches are going to launch and new things are going to be happening. I was just emailing with the pastor last night that I know something is going to be happening in the next year or two to impact the kingdom. And so we're excited for this. This is an event that is planned to be happening every single year. As I mentioned on the first panel, this event has been funded by our Multiplication and Discipleship Fund, which was founded by Reverend Dr. Ron and Martha Duncan and Reverend Vernon and Jan Maddox. We also received significant funding from the Texas Assembly of the Church of God and Church of God of Ohio. And we are so excited for the way that this event is bringing together voices from various pockets in the church world. Being, con being a connecting institution in the Church of God, which I believe Anderson University School of Theology is, I love the opportunity I have to walk in a variety of circles, attend a variety of regional assembly meetings, hear from students from across the country and even around the world. In this capacity, we believe the seminary is uniquely situated to collaborate with regions, national groups, and other stakeholders who have a vision for multiplication and discipleship. I personally believe in this effort and have given funds of my own. Um, and today, I want to ask you to consider a gift. Is there a way that your assembly, your church, you yourself, believes in sowing some seeds so that we can continue to offer this resource? The people of God learn together and move together when they have the ideas and they hear the stories and they get to celebrate the impact that God is doing across the movement and in other movements. And I know that in coming years, we're going to be able to bring really quality content, really quality resourcing that is going to ignite and spark future ideas, future expressions. Uh, it's going to build up a passion in people's hearts. If you want to give now, you can give through the QR code. You can mail a check to Anderson University at 1100 East 5th Street, Anderson, Indiana, 46012. And just designate church multiplication. If you say only multiplication, I'll work with the math department to make sure that comes over to the seminary. But we are, we are expectant for what God is going to do through this. We are thankful for your time. We are prayerful for the work that God is already doing and will do in you. So thank you for joining. I pray that you'll consider a gift. Uh, we are approaching halfway to our goal of endowing this so that it is there forever. And we just are so hopeful and expectant for the way God is going to build up something in you. I am so thankful for you, and I am so expectant for what God is doing through and in your ministry. Have a good day.